Right. It's live now, sir. Right, right. Okay, continue. I can click continue. Okay. So, Charita, are you, you're in, um, oh, where are you? Oh, no, hang on. I'm in Kolkata. In Kolkata. Ah, you've, you've traveled, so you're not in Delhi, at Jadavpur. Delhi, uh, Jadavpur is in Kolkata. Oh, of course it is. Yes, of course it is. Yes. Yes. Devlina went there, didn't she? She was there as well in her early days. Yes. My colleague, Devlina Ghosh. Yes, yes. Hari, can you admit all the attendees? The requests are also coming on my screen, Rindon. Yes, ma'am. Um, Hari, uh, is my screen visible? Uh, screen is visible. But from my end, I can see that all the participants who've been asking to enter are already in. As and when there are other requests, I will ensure that they are also let in. Okay, but uh, Arunjit, sir, can you stop my screen sharing? Somehow it's not working from my side. Ah, just a second. So the screen is not visible now, right, Hari? No, it's not. Okay. A very good afternoon, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural lecture of the talk series on sustainable development by Professor Emerita Hidar Goodall from University of Technology, Sydney. I'm also very glad to inform you that today's session will be chaired by Professor Shuchurita Chattopadhyay. Professor Shuchurita Chattopadhyay is professor at the Department of Comparative Literature and also coordinator of the Center for Canadian Studies, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. She is also the former president of the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute. On behalf of Sri Sri University, I welcome you both for giving us time from your busy schedule. Sustainable development cannot be achieved in isolation from the close relationship between higher education and its institutions, namely universities and society. Universities are considered an essential pillar of the society because they play a pivotal role in elevating awareness regarding social responsibility among its students, staff members, and other employees in a manner that makes them behave as societal personalities prof professing collective views and not opting to adopt individual thinking. On the auspicious occasion of Pooja Gurudev's 65th birthday and 40th anniversary of Art of Living, we, the members of Sri Sri University, have started the 40 initiatives, Mission 14 to 40, as a humble tribute to Pooja Gurudev this lecture series on sustainable development is a one of the 40 initiatives. I now request Professor Shucharita Chattopadhyay to introduce our esteemed speaker and start the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Rindan. It's my pleasure to chair this inaugural session and I would be introducing the speaker to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure, ma'am, Heather Goodall to welcome you. She is Professor Emerita of History 
and has researched and published in three major areas, indigenous histories and relationships in Australia, environmental history and intercolonial networks. She is a historian who researches and publishes on indigenous histories, environmental histories and decolonization histories in India, Australia and the Eastern Indian Ocean. She has co-authored with Aboriginal activists, Isabel Flick and Kevin Cook. Growing up on Sydney's George's River, Heather has analyzed river environmental history and politics in rural areas and in cities. She was a researcher on the Australian inquiry into British nuclear testing in Australia. Her chapter on the impact of British nuclear weapons testing on indigenous people in Australia and US testing on the Marshall Islanders is included in the Rutledge Companion to Indigenous Global History, which is still in press. Her book, Invasion to Embassy, 1996, won NSW Premier Prize for Australian History. Some further recent publications include the Urban Environmental History, Rivers and Resilience, Aboriginal People on Sydney George's River, co-authored with Alison Kadzo, 2009, shortlisted for NSW Premier Award for Community History. The Life Story, Isabel Flick, The Many Lives of an Extra Extraordinary Aboriginal Woman, co-authored with Isabel Flick in 2004, which won the Marjorie Medal for Australian Women Biography and the co-edited Water, Borders and Sovereignty in Asia and Oceania, 2009, Rutledge. And Echoes from the Poisoned Well, Global Memories of Environmental Injustice, 2006, Lexington. Most recently, she has published the co-authored Teacher for Justice, Lucy Woodcock's Transnational Life, 2020, and George's River Blues, Swamps, Mangroves, and Resident Action, 1945 to 1980. This is in 2000, 2021. This is in 2021. It's a pleasure, Heather, to see that we do have common research interests mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I have focused a lot on indigenous Canadian uh lives literature and culture maybe we'll catch up on that some other day right now over to you heather thank you very much i i really appreciate that introduction it's very generous and i'd like to thank everyone there at Sri Sri university for uh bringing me uh along in this uh digital format I would love to be there in person and I hope to make it there one day once we've got rid of all of these illnesses. But um, I would also like to um, to say that I'm speaking to you from Wongal Wongal land, which is the unceded territory of Darug speaking peoples on um, around Port Jackson, around Sydney. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge their continuing presence and the presence of many Aboriginal people around Sydney. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, very much to thank Rindan Kundu, the Assistant Professor and Postgraduate Coordinator, but also the Director of the Centre um, for Translation and Interpreting Studies, who has very kindly invited me here, as well as to thank you, Sucharita, for that very warm introduction. I appreciate it very much. Now, um, perhaps I can, should I share my screen now? I'll give it a go. It's a bit messy. Now, I've just got to try and find my... my PowerPoint. Wait a minute. And there it is. Now, how's that? Is it possible to see that? Um, Hare Krishna, can you see that? Yes, it's visible. 
it's visible. Good. Yes. Um, let's see if I can um, escape from my. Um, whoops, sorry. I'll just go backwards, and um, I just need to see if I can um, move into um, my. Uh, I'm just trying to avoid taking up the whole screen, but I don't think I can. Okay. Here we are. So you can all see that. Um, and I just can't. Okay, I can. I, I'm still seeing um, Suchrita, not myself. So that's all right. Can you see that, everybody? It is yes. Visible now. It is visible. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Look, I'm. Um, I'm now. Um, so I can see Hari Krishna now. That's great. <laughs> I can't see me, but I can see. I can see Hari and I can see a few people there. So that's good. I can see myself. Now, um, I'm a historian. And as I've said in my abstract, the way that I approach an issue of environmental uh, challenges of the day is to think historically. And it seems to me that it's crucial that we start by understanding the environmental impact of colonialism. And we have to understand that we are in, in the world today looking at the economic burden of a colonial past that has, has affected obviously South Asia enormously heavily, but it has also affected Australia. And so in some ways we are, we are considering similar issues, although in Australia, of course, it is now um, the outcome of, of a, a majority settler population and indigenous people still regard themselves as colonized. It's no longer, it's not post-colonial in their view. It continues to be a colonial present. But I think the important uh, issue in terms of environment is to consider the economics of colonialism and the way that the colonial structure um, put uh, pressure on the economies of colonized countries. Andre Gunda Frank developed a theory of underdevelopment, um, which I found very helpful when um, in 1967, it was very early. It's been, it's been modified and developed since then, but it has, it has been an important source of our understandings of the way colonialism impacts on uh, colonized people's uh, environments. And in South Asia, what we saw in, in British India was the deindustrialization of uh, indigenous uh, production, like the textile production, textile industries. And we saw the economies and the relationships with the environment in South Asia changed to suit the economies of the colonizing country of the British. So increasingly um, areas of, of land in India were moved into producing the raw materials which uh, the British wanted, in particular cotton and uh, sugar and uh, issues like it, commodities like tea. Um, so the circulation of these um, raw materials um, being produced in colonies also involved the circulation of people. So labor was a crucial part of the way that colonizers, as you know, controlled colonies. So by erasing the capacity of um, small scale agriculturists, for example, to uh, uh, have their, um, to have farms, to have small scale agricultural systems, it released, um, as the British would say, laborers to work in the production of raw materials. What happened with the raw materials, which were then shipped, transported to the colonizing country, to be manufactured in early industrial in factories was that these were then circulated as cheap um, imports to other colonies as well as to the colony where the raw materials were produced. Now that had a massive impact on all of the colonies 
um, certainly including Australia, where land was stolen from Indigenous peoples, um, as well as India, where land was stolen, of course, from Indians um, in many, many areas, and where labour was forced into, people were forced into labouring for the services of production of raw materials. Now, um, that, I'll just go back to where I was because I have to do this apparently. Okay, so it's all right. I'm just working out this is a slightly different system. Um, it became clear that um, independence was going to mean a big change in the economy of all colonies and certainly South Asia. And the enormous demand and expectation was that independence would mean not only political freedom, but economic freedom for people to develop and to, to share the benefits of the developed capitalist colonizing world, or indeed the developed communist world, which had um, developed at, at often at the expense of the resources of um, underdeveloped areas of the world. So we're not only talking about capitalist development, but that is primarily the, the um, form of um, economic production, and, and you're all better economists than I am, of the colonizing countries that shaped South Asia. Now, um, <clears throat> that developmental process imposed um, pressures also on the environment of South Asia. And so um, the, the intention of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, of independent India, was to have a development which would be socially just, which would be equitable, um, which would be planned, and which would support the emergence out of poverty of many South Asians. But to do that, um, the early governments of independent India were often advocating a massive increase in things like um, um, electricity production. Now, even where that was a renewable form, for example, in hydroelectricity, that meant uh, pressure on farming lands, which were submerged in order to create those dams. And um, where it it was uh, in terms of electricity production through coal. It meant pressure on the lands of people whose uh, coal area was mined, as well as um, pressure on the uh, surrounding environment. So um, the question became urgent in capitalist developed countries to argue, to see whether there were limits to this growth. And there had been hints and obvious signs of this early on. Um, and as I've suggested, this first line is just the, 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 the idea that with independence, there would be development, that development would, would come from the independent uh, colonies who would be able to organize their own environments, their own economies for the uh, development of their people. But as, as in, from the early 20th century, really, we were starting to see. But in 1972, there was a book published uh, in the United States called The Limits to Growth. And this, this group organized uh, computer modeling to look at what happened when you had unrestrained industrialization, when you just kept producing in the manufacturing forms, which were... Um, the, the methods of industrial production in capitalist developed countries. And what they found was that there were limits to resources, that these would simply run out. These obviously were coal and iron ore, the sorts of raw materials that were used for factory production, but it was also the living world. This were the fish that were caught by fishing people, um, particularly as the technologies of fishing, as we all know, and certainly this is a, a, an issue in for people on the coast in India. Um, uh, the, the, the massive technologies of fishing were extracting far more than uh, 
the reproduction of the species could, uh, could maintain. So Meadows and others produced computer scenarios which generated possible futures. And in two out of three of their predicted futures, there was total collapse. Um, only one of them could possibly be sustained after 100 years or so. Now, initially, there was a lot of contempt and criticism of Meadows' work, but gradually it came to be recognised that this was really legitimate um, modelling. It wasn't perfect, but it was legitimate modelling. Now, as I said, much earlier than that, there had begun to be concerns about um, industrialization. Silent Spring, in fact, had been published in 1962. It was an argument about the residue, well, the, the inputs for industrialized agriculture. And um, Rachel Carsons was arguing that pesticides were damaging not only the things which might be damaging crops, but all the rest of the environment. And that the implication of continuing to use pesticides would mean that we would have silent springs, there would be no birds. Um, there would be many of the living um, creatures which we expected to be part of our environment and which in fact we needed would be destroyed. But what Limits to Growth did not recognise was human rights and environmental justice. Um, so it didn't recognise um, the issues around waste and around accidents and around air quality and water quality of those people who were forced to live around housing. Because the amenity in those areas was poor, housing was cheaper and it meant that the people who lived around factories were often subject to um, really severely poor air and water quality very quickly. Um, and it became very clear very fast um, by the middle of the 20th century in a series of catastrophic accidents. Um, you'll be aware of some of them here and I'll mention them, but one of the earliest ones that uh, was, was known was a, the outcomes became evident in the 1970s of the dumping of toxic waste in an area which had been excavated um, in, uh, in, in an area in the north of India, in the north of, sorry, in the north of America, in the north of New York State called uh, Niagara, where a canal had been excavated on a plan by a Mr. Love, or hence its name, the Love Canal. Um, it hadn't been useful, it hadn't been used, but it had become to be a toxic waste dump. Now that had then become um, leveled over, reclaimed, and it had been turned into a housing development. And by the 1970s, there was massive illness among all the people who were living there because of the toxicity of the soil. You know about this because of the catastrophic accident that occurred at the Union Carbide factory in 1984, when leaks from that factory killed so many people who were living around it. Um, it was a catastrophic accident, which um, not only killed many people instantly, but maimed and damaged the lives and livelihood of others for decades and for the rest of their lives in many cases. And then there was Chernobyl, 1986, where um, a nuclear power plant, which wasn't in fact in the USSR, it was in the Ukraine, near the border with Belarus. And those places are, are coping now with the, uh, the catastrophic waste problem that is there. But this um, meltdown of a reactor released um, poisonous, toxic, radioactive waste into the atmosphere, which then circulated the globe. So many, many people became um, affected by what was essentially an accident of the technology, a failure. Um, and this was like many other uh, events which occurred both in the developing world and in the developed world. Um, Britain, the United States weren't immune from this, just like developing countries weren't. But these began to demonstrate that it was not just about um, the limits of resources, but it was about the impact of industrialization on the people closest, on the workers, and on the people who were living around um, the areas where toxic waste was being dumped. Now, 
the next stage, I think, in the emergence and development, I mean, as, as will be evident from what I've been saying already, the concept of sustainable development did not exist, or it, it had been assumed that it could go on forever, but Meadows and Carsons and others had demonstrated that it couldn't, and the accidents were proving that. So the United Nations organised a, um, a, an inquiry which went for three years. It was headed by um, a bloke called Gro Brundtland, who was a former prime minister of Norway, who took this really seriously. Um, Scandinavians, as you know, regard themselves as not really being part of the colonising world, and we could argue with that. But nevertheless, um, Gro Brundtland took this commission very seriously. For three years, the inquiry took evidence and they had discussions, they took submissions from many countries around the world. They came out with a report called Our Common Future, which is still regarded extremely positively and regarded as an important source of the basic definition of what sustainable development would be. And this is their definition. Sustainable development was development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, this was the first time there had been even a, 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 an idea that, that this could be done, that the scenarios of inevitable collapse could be avoided, but Brundtland was quite clear about the requirements for that to be developed. It had to be the only way sustainable development could be created was if there was a recognition of the interdependence of all of the nations of the world. <clears throat> and if there was a recognition that the inequality between nations and between classes was one of the causes of the, the, the toxicity of development, that unless poverty could be eradicated, poverty and inequality between nations, but also within nations, the demands on the environment would continually increase until collapse occurred. So he was arguing that poverty was a cause of environmental damage and it had to be eradicated with equality being achieved, not only between nations, but within nations. Um, UNESCO, um, no, so what he's arguing is that, that poverty increases that pressure on resources and it reduces the capacity for sustainability to be achieved. So clearly poverty needed to be the way through to develop sustainability. Um, UNESCO adopted that approach and they argue that there are four dimensions to development that we have to consider. Um, there is the societal impact of any development. There's the impact on the environment. There is the impact on culture and there is the impact on the economy. They've argued that that's a global, um, a global responsibility in thinking about development. In Australia, uh, we've sort of adopted a little bit of that. Um, most planning in Australia is very local it considers only the local environment, but it does at least have three bottom lines now. The triple bottom line is, is one of the um, regularly mouthed cliches about how development will be uh, conducted. That is an economic bottom line. So development has to achieve um, some sort of profitable outcome we have to consider the environmental impacts. So there has to be a formal environmental impact assessment done of any development proposal. Now the social impact assessments are far less frequently done. It's harder to evaluate social impacts of development. And this is um, an element of the triple bottom line, which is often marginalized and ignored or assumed to be uh, fixed up if you've got an economic profit going on. Nevertheless, this is some expansion which has occurred since the 1980s. Now, the question, if we look at this globally, is who should pay? How is this gonna work? The global north 
the colonizing countries have been the longest industrialized and they are the biggest users of resources. The global south, the developing world, are if you look at it per person, if you divide gross national product by population, um, you find these are of course the poorest nations. They are the newest to industrialize and they are the lowest users of resources again per person. So clearly, um, globally, the global north should be contributing to the ways in which the global south can address questions about poverty and can develop the most sustainable use of resources. However, there have been very few agreements. It won't surprise you to know that uh, the developing world, the capitalist world and the communist world has been reluctant to be um, too generous in the aid, which is often a loan rather than uh, a, a genuine gift um, to the developing world in order to support the process of environmental protection and developing towards a more sustainable form of development. So um, Paris in 2015 was important, but the United Nations began working towards some sustainability before this and from soon after the Brundtland report um, they formulated Millennium Development Goals. These were eight goals which they set up which tried to build on the work of the Brundtland report. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see these I'll just talk about them um, briefly. Um, the idea was that you would set a goal. Now, they were called the Millennium Goals, but they weren't intended to be fulfilled by 2000, the change of the millennium. The goal was to have these approached or fulfilled by 2015. So there was a, a deadline, there was a date, and these could be measured. So the question is, as a strategy, does this strategy work? How useful is measuring? It's a big issue in Australia because the Australian government, as you know, refuses to set a date, refuses to set a target um, on its uh, environmental policies. But what can we see from measuring and, and how useful is this? Now, the first one following the Brundtland report, the first goal was eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. And what do we see? We see um, that in terms of measuring, we can actually see a difference. These countries have set goals um, around the world. We can see that if we, this is, this is UNESCO's figures, that in 1990, there were 47% of people living in extreme poverty. And this was a definition of um, living on less than uh, $1.25 US a day. I'm sure there's other ways to measure poverty, but this was the way they chose. In 1990, 47% of people lived in extreme poverty, but in 2015, only 14% lived in extreme poverty. So the process of measuring offered some way to evaluate what was going on. The global number, the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty had similarly um, uh, sorry, that, that first figure was the proportion in developing countries, which is important in absolute terms around the globe. Um, you can see that figure has, has been reduced um, from a far higher figure, 1,926 million in 1990 to 836 million in 2015. So there is some way in which we can see that at least something has been achieved. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, we can look at the gender goal, um, which was number three, to promote gender equality and to empower women. And if we look at this in South Asia alone, we can see that now for every 100 boys in primary school, the number of girls in primary school has increased from 74 to 103. So this is an important way to measure what's, what's going on. In terms of environment, the ways that uh, were being measured were access to water, 
Um, and so here again, you could see a change in the number of people who had access to pipe drinking water. And another one of the measures, um, sorry, that's just, just, there we are. Another one of the measures was um, the reduction of ozone depleting substances. Now, this is interesting because this takes us from the resources, the material resources of the world, which is what Brundtland had focused on and what the argument was about reducing poverty as a way to reduce the impact on resources. The issue of ozone depleting substances is an interesting one because attention had been starting to turn to the atmosphere that envelops the globe. And it was found that the, um, that the atmosphere that envelops the globe protects the earth and the humans and all the living beings on it, botanical and, and, and zoological, it protects all of us from UV rays, the, the most damaging of the sun's rays. But the um, CFCs, the stuff that propel things in spray cans, which of course are mostly used in developed economies, but nevertheless, the CFCs in spray cans were causing holes, gaps in the ozone layer over the poles. So the holes in the ozone layer, because of the circulating atmospheric um, currents, meant that the amount of ozone was thinnest. Um, there was less ozone over the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, and that these ozone holes were expanding. And it was the CFCs which were damaging the ozone layers. So one of the things that the... Um, uh, the the goals of the uh, millennium sorry the, the goals of the millennium um, uh, uh, sustainability the millennium development goals were attempting to do was to end the the use of those ozone depleting substances the CFCs and they largely achieved it between 1990 and 2015 this was largely um, uh, a, a, an an effort on the part of uh, developed economies um, and it, there was a shift away from um, uh, propellant cans to the use of sprays and other types of things which were just pump operated rather than gas operated. So there were some things going on but the interesting thing here is that the atmosphere had started to be a source of attention because what was happening was that the attention of people concerned about development and sorry, I just have to do it a different way. The um, scientists had begun to realize that there were far more serious problems occurring with the um, environment, the envelope around the earth than had been understood just by the CFCs. Now this is um, attention finally to climate change. This is a shift which is occurring in the 1990s among a number of quite widely different and dispersed scientific communities looking at the way the atmosphere itself had changed. Since the Industrial Revolution began in the middle of the 19th century, there had been an increase in what were called greenhouse gases. And those greenhouse gases created an effect in the Earth's atmosphere, which was like putting a blanket around the Earth. It was making it warmer. And it was doing this by reflecting the heat that was coming from all the different sources on Earth, which would rise, but when it got to the atmospheric level, it was being reflected back to Earth. Now, those greenhouse gases, um, the GHGs, as I'll use them in occasional um, acronyms through this talk, kept heat in. Now, developing nations consume least, but they are the worst impacted by climate change because climate change causes sea level rise, it causes drought, it causes um, more extreme cyclonic weather. Now, this map 
of Odisha is here because Odisha is one of the places which suffers most even in South Asia. Um, along the coastline, along the Bay of Bengal, you suffer from intense cyclones. This in intensity of cyclonic activity is increased by climate change. Um, sea level rise is caused by the warming of the atmosphere and the oceans, which um, melts the ice caps, which raises the level of the sea. So many of those areas along the coastline of Odisha, as you know, and along the rivers, are impacted by rising water levels. But in Katak, in the city, you're not um, spared from this either, just because you're a little bit away from the coast. You suffer from the impact of atmospheric um, uh, challenges from industrialization, but also from heat um, and from the changing uh, retention of, um, of greenhouse gases. So, Whereas the concern about resources and the running out of resources or the toxic waste products were local to some extent, local issues, they were issues of one area or one nation, the atmosphere is a global problem. It is poor people who suffer the worst. It is people in Odisha who suffer worst, but it is a global problem that has to be fixed by changing the overall atmospheric. This is not just the poles. This is all of the um, all of the atmosphere. Now, the global um, the the sorry the um, uh, the greenhouse gases which are which cause a great deal of impact because of their greatest extent are carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is produced most um, extensively from um, coal-fired power stations, as well as from natural gas extraction. And indeed, coal mining itself and putting coal into both steel making and into power production increases the, um, uh, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere, which increases that blanket greenhouse effect. But an even worse greenhouse gas is methane which is produced by intensive agriculture. Um, so it's produced by the uh, digestion um, systems of cattle, um, digesting grass. Now, this is a big issue in areas like um, the developed world where the, the herds of beef cattle, where the, where the population eats a lot of meat and where there's an enormous demand for large herds of cattle. So, even methane um, is produced more actively in the developed world than it is in the developing world. And so again, um, the question about how we go about changing this is a really big one, but it's a global question. This, is, this really does change everything from being a local one to a global one. So how do we reduce global warming? The Paris Agreement in, 19, in 2015 was really the first international agreement that was legally binding. It was addressed precisely to climate change um, and it argued um, on, on very good scientific advice that unless the global temperature could be, the temperature rise could be kept under two degrees centigrade, that the results would be catastrophic for life on earth. Um, ideally, it should be kept below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, this, this, as I said, is a legally binding argument. So countries which signed up to it, uh, which includes your country and my country, um, your country ultimately, I think was involved, um, but it did not produce a funding scheme. Um, although there have been lots of promises about where funding would come from. Um, it, it did, however, sh redirect attention away from um, material resources to the release of fossil fuels, um, to the use of fossil fuels to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this has been extremely important in, in working out strategies for addressing development which might be sustainable. 
but should the cost be shared equally? This is an expensive process because again, not only do we have the global north being the longest industrialized and the greatest user of resources, but it's also the greatest emitter of greenhouse gases. The global south, as you know, is the poorest poor person, has the newest industry and the lowest emissions per person of greenhouse gases. So there's a strong argument that the global north should pay the global south to address technology and to aid the transitions to renewable energy so that the outcomes are less CO2 and methane in the atmosphere. So there are various strategies to do this, but um, let's just have a look. This is produced by the uh, International Panel on Climate Change, which set up by the United Nations, a really useful source of information. Um, it was set up to provide current up-to-date best practice scientific information to policymakers around the world in any country from the United Nations. This um, pie diagram shows you the contribution of different countries to cumulative global CO2 emissions. So that's a major form of greenhouse gas. And clearly the United States and Europe, um, but also China and Russia are producing large amounts as indeed India is at least on the graph there um, and is visible in that contribution. But unquestionably the developed world is producing the most emissions of um, greenhouse gases. So what are, what are countries doing? Let's see, if the national positions on fossil fuel. In Australia, what's happening here in my country is that there are a lot of people who are even still denying the fact that climate change exists at all. And they're certainly refusing to count exports and that's the current government position. So the federal government says, we've met all our targets. We're going really well. We've in fact exceeded our targets. And in fact, any further cut to fossil fuel um, mining and power extraction or export would mean jobs. What they actually mean is votes. They're worried about losing votes in uh, the big uh, coal mining areas. But um, by not counting exports, it means all of the fossil fuels which are dug up in Australia, but burnt for power in India or other countries in the developing world don't count in our total. They count in your totals, which is really unfair. So even despite Australia's incredibly large um, coastline and its huge heat sensitive areas, this denial has continued and there has been an increase in coal mining on Aboriginal land, but also now on prime agricultural land that settlers owned and were doing very nicely from, thank you. So you have a really interesting alliance developed between or developing between um, settler farmers, agriculturalists, big farmers, not company farmers, but big family farmers and Aboriginal people, both of them trying to stop mining on their land. But what you have is state, both state and federal collusion with the coal industry because it's argued that coal mining jobs will mean votes to be lost to the major parties. What's happening in India? India demands climate action. As you know, it's got, and it argues that this is why it's demanding climate action because it has large heat sensitive areas and it's got a long coastline and you're very aware of that in Odisha. And it aims to increase renewables. And there is a really big push on in India now to develop um, solar farms and wind farms. But the question as an environmental justice historian like myself is who pays for this? It seems to me that we need to be thinking a lot more clearly about who pays for renewable energy in India. One of the things that's happening, and this is research which uh, Priya Pillay and Devlina Kosh are working on in um, Eastern India, as well as in um, Karnataka. 
they are looking at the ways in which solar and wind farms are being managed. And we can see that there is clearly a big commitment to renewable energy, to uh, solar and to wind. And there is also um, apparently a recognition that uh, the curl, uh, earlier coal mining was destroying land. It was predominantly Adivasi land, but it was destroying land. Whereas now the solar farms and the wind farms are renting the land of farmers, which is regarded as a, a, a greater, as a more just way to um, recompense farmers for the use of their land. And ultimately the land will return to them. However, um, the people who don't benefit from this are the landless labourers who previously were able to get a, 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 an income from work on the agricultural land, but who are now completely out of a job. So landless labourers are in fact marginalised and disadvantaged by this um, expansion of renewable energy because the issues of justice haven't been thought out in it. And just as importantly is that um, India remains committed to uh, development at the same pace. And so coal-fired power has in, is increasing as well. This will continue to mine forest land at Adivasi expense. And there are clashes here about the Forest Rights Act. But the, the, the use of, of coal-fired, um, fossil fuel-fired power production is going to continue and in fact expand, even though renewables are expanding as well. So there are livelihood issues both for Adivasi and forests with coal miners, for um, agricultural people who are questioning whether they will ever get their land back, uh, whether it will come back in a damaged form, whether their children will learn the skills of being farmers, but particularly livelihood issues for landless labourers who have been denied employment there. So all of this means that there are major justice issues involved with Indian approaches. And there has been state collusion with energy industries, both coal and renewable, which are operating in ways which do not consider the social justice dimensions of the way the, uh, the, the resources are being extracted and used. Um, this is not the intention of the independent governments of India in the early days, and there are many people who are opposed to this. There's a very strong and developing um, movement in India, which is uh, challenging the use of coal and, and of renewables in this way, which does not recognise the justice issues. So there are common grounds um, between Australian and Indian environmentalists. Those grounds are human rights and environmental justice and their democracy and politics. They're about whether our governments in Australia or your government there in India are colluding with um, the industrial groups, either the coal or the whole broader energy industry. And that collusion is occurring at, to the disadvantage of, um, of the, uh, the population. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the United Nations, having got past 19, uh, 2015, have moved on to develop what they call sustainable development goals. This is um, a goal which is set to have a target date of 2030. But what we have here is not eight goals like the, the Millennium Sustainability Goals. We have 17. Um, it seems to me this is challenging to get across 17 goals. Um, and I'm really strongly suggesting, and I've, uh, I'll send the, uh, this PowerPoint um, to Rindon, who will be able to circulate it. But on the next slide, you'll see the link to the BBC programs, which you can download, hopefully, as podcasts, called Project 17, where they are, the BBC has asked 17 year olds in countries around the world to take one of these goals and to look at the way it is being pursued 
within their own country. Um, but our first question I think we can ask is, where is climate change? Um, climate change is in there. Uh, goal seven and goal 13, as you can see, affordable and clean energy and climate action both demand a recognition of climate change and the importance of addressing the concerns. They don't necessarily uh, take us further to, um, to get there. But those, those climate change goals are embedded in an environmental justice network. And that I think is a really important step forward. So even though the United Nations 17 goals looks um, impossibly broad and diverse, um, focusing on them, using that strategy of measuring is, is an important tool in understanding how these goals might be met and thinking about the environmental justice at the same time of the way in which the scientific or the physical or the economic goals are being met. And the person who is 17, who has done this exploration in India is Saha. Saha lives in New Delhi. And um, if you download, you can see that the link is on the screen and uh, I'll send this to Rindon who can circulate it to other people. Saha is pursuing the degree to which the gender equality goal is being pursued in South Asia, in India, just in India. Um, there are other people who are other 17 year olds who are looking at Bangladesh, for example. Saha is fascinating. She talks to a number of different people as well as giving her own views. She travels across the country and she's, um, she, she offers a perspective on how far people might be taking this seriously. Now, this of course was done before the COVID crisis hit. And so um, there will be changes which, which will be brought into our understanding of what can produce sustainable development that relate to the, the COVID pressures, which are clearly about encroaching further and more and more closely into the more than human world. And the, the ways in which those boundaries are crossed means that the viral boundaries are crossed as well. Now, this is my last slide. Um, there is no conclusion to this lecture because in my view, sustainable development is still an open question. We, we don't know whether it's going to be achieved. Is it going to be possible to keep global temperature change down below two degrees centigrade, below one and a half degrees centigrade? We don't know. It is going to be up to you. We don't know if the shift to renewables in Australia or India is going to be a shift away from coal. Is this going to be done with justice in a way which reduces poverty and reduces the pressures on resources, as well as reducing the pressure to increase the emission of global uh, greenhouse gases. All of these things are open questions and you are the people and people like me who've got some sort of standing and academic position, but, but 17 year olds, it's gonna be Saha. It's gonna be people like her and you can listen to all of their interviews with other young people around their countries. It is those people and it's us, it's all of us together all of our disciplines, who are going to maybe make some changes and make sustainable development into a reality in the future. We're not there yet, but hopefully we'll get there. So I'll finish on that point and open it up for questions and answers, and I will stop sharing my screen. Somebody can, um, Rindon, if you can organise to stop my screen sharing, that will be great. I will end my thing. Stop share. No, I stopped it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. It was such a fascinating talk.
It was such a fascinating talk. And thank you so much for focusing on issues which are of such tremendous importance in today's world. We all talk about it, we are aware of it, but this was such a consolidated presentation. I mean, addressing all the important issues together. So I really, really, Rinal, is it a problem if the recording seems okay, fine. So uh, Heather has spoken at length about the awareness about and protection of our environment, environment and which is one of the key concerns worldwide today. And it is also an important component of the SDG goals. The SDG goals that are being followed worldwide. A lot of people are talking about SDG goals at times without properly understanding what it means. Oh, sorry. So Heather's talk has actually covered extensive areas and issues. And it, it really talks about her deep conviction about the topic and her commitment towards the importance of protecting our environment. SDG has to be created to stop the degeneration of our world. And it's not just Australia and India that we are talking about, it's the world at large. And it also aims, she has addressed this issue of saving the world from toxicity, which is largely arising out of economic inequality, social inequality, the difference that exists between nations, as well as the difference that exists within nations. And she has highlighted on poverty as one of the key components that needs to be addressed. And this in relationship with our environment, with the economic scenario and the social scenario. So environmental protection is something which needs to be ascertained at any cost. Heather has also focused on water, which is of key importance, one of the key factors in human lives. Then atmosphere, climate change. We talk a lot about global warming. How much do we actually contribute actively towards lessening global warming? So the, the way she has uh, explained the greenhouse gas effect, how that is affecting the climate worldwide, uh, this is something very, very thought provoking. And I completely agree when she says that the impact of climate change is felt more strongly among the developing countries. It is, it is so true. We see it all around us. And this global warming is something that the entire world is reeling under. And if I may uh, bring to your notice the sudden massive heat wave, which was there in British Columbia, Canada, just a few days back, which killed so many people. It's a, a heat wave there in British Columbia and in Alberta is a very, very uncommon phenomenon. So it was bad enough to kill people. So she also made a distinction between the global north and the global south, the positions held, the realities of the global north and the realities of the global south, global south, which is essentially still developing definitely in comparison to global north in a poorer state. So which leaves us with an open-ended situation. How do we best uh, pursue this particular uh, case? How do we ensure that we leave behind a better world for the younger people? 
and the contribution of the younger people. Mm. How many of them are coming forward? I find that the very, very young people are more committed towards it than the middle aged group. Somehow that is, that distinction is very clear. School leaving kids, early young adults, they are somehow more aware of these. So let's see how much is viable and what exactly can be achieved. And the, there is the need to draw in more and more younger people. I completely agree with this. I welcome questions from those who have been listening to this talk. Uh, Heather, can you see the question or do, would you want me to read them? Uh, Rindan, can somebody read out the question? Yes, ma'am, I, I will do that. One by uh, one, if you can read out the question, then maybe Heather will be able to address. Yes. Maybe Sharda, uh, perhaps. Uh, Dr. Sharda Acharya, uh, she's asking that can I stupas as artificially created by the Indian innovator, Sonam Wangchuk, have significant impact on the globe if practiced consciously everywhere? I, um, I, I don't know of this work and I would be very interested in hearing from Shada about how, um, how it works and, and what the principle is. Uh, Sharda ma'am, can you please uh, elaborate on that particular point? Yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to thank our presenter who has shown Im immense light on uh, the present scenario of sustainable development goals that we are lagging behind in achieving. Uh, I was uh, just a couple of days back, I was, uh, I came across uh, this, in this Indian movie, Holly Bollywood movie, in which uh, uh, we have this reflection of this Indian innovator, come scientist, come educationist, come reformist, who uh, belongs to Ladakh, the northern part of India. And um, he is known for, I think it's way back in 1997, I think, he had uh, created some artificial glaciers with some of his, he's an engineer by um, uh, academically and by profession. Um, so I was just curious that he had used some kind of mechanism to create the water is thrust, thrust out and then it, it gets uh, frozen and forms a huge mountain, looks like a glacier. So it is artificially created uh, ice uh, bodies. So I was just curious if such activities or that uh, such initiatives, if it is taken consciously by nations across the globe, such artificial um, engagements, will that make difference? Like decreasing uh, the temperature of the globe by two degree, as Ma'am said. Um, if I could, I mean, I, I'm sure there will be people who could address the um, the issues who, who were more familiar with this work. But um, in, in my view, I think, the what has shifted um, in the last 10 years or five years really is a sense of the urgency of this problem. Um, the change in global temperature is, that it is occurring at a much faster rate than, um, than was previously expected. And so it is in fact becoming important to act very quickly. And the quickest way to act is to change emissions. I think all of the possibilities are going to be very welcomed and there should be a great deal more learning and collaboration. Um, in fact, that's one of the, uh, one of the sustainability goals, um, uh, uh, the, the current UN goals is about developing partnerships and learning um, to, 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 to talk to each other across national borders and languages about scientific innovation and cultural innovation, which might change climate 
um, uh, impacts as well as uh, to shape the way that people and the living environment copes. But the fastest way, the quickest way, and we don't have time anymore to to take shortcuts. We have to do this. We or to 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 not do things as fast as possible um, is to change emissions, and that means changing uh, power generation. Basically, it means keeping all of the fossil fuels in the ground not digging up anymore and not generating power in that way anymore. Now, that's the quickest way and the most urgent way to change the greenhouse effect. And if we don't do that, we aren't going to have time to try out all those other possibilities. So thank you very much for that question. I think that's really important. Um, we could move on perhaps to... Yes, uh, thank you, Sharda, ma'am. She is my colleague in the Department of English and Foreign Languages, Sri Sri University. Thank you, Hida, for the answering. Uh, the next question is from Shashwati Shah of Sikkim University. Although in higher academia, we have begun a discussion on sustainable development, how do you think that such consciousness and sensibility can be percolated to the common masses especially of those of the developing nations, where, as you know, people suffer from the anxiety of deprivation and try to snatch the smallest available resources without thinking about the others. I think it's, uh, I mean, my, my personal response to that is that, <clears throat> that this is an urgent problem for everyone because everyone feels it and it is, impacting now as we speak on the livelihood of certainly farming people, certainly of Adivasi in India and of coastal people who are subject to more catastrophic cyclonic activity. So people's livelihoods are already being affected as they are in Australia um, where the, uh, the impact of mining uh, is making a profit for a small number of people and keeping governments in power but it is impacting the capacity of the landscape to uh, produce food. And it is also impacting on the capacity of the landscape to sustain the spiritual life of its populations. Now, um, it means that the, the livelihood issues are becoming much more evident to more people in the rest of the community. It's not only the scientific uh, people or indeed the politicians who are taking a lot less notice. But what is happening, I think, just as some, um, uh, as uh, Sucharita argued, is that in fact, younger people are coming on board. I mean, we can, we can look at the climate school strikes. Young people can see their future evaporating. And I think, I think political action on the part of everybody you know, speaking up, when I say political action, I mean speaking up, talking to friends, talking to neighbours, talking in public, writing letters, um, speaking as those of us who have academic positions are in a position of power in that we offer, um, we publish books, we teach lectures, we talk to people. Our, our insights and the connections we can make with uh, the scientific world are important for our students, whatever discipline we teach in. And so I think uh, young people taking action is crucially important. Um, Greta Thunberg and, and many, many thousands, millions, in fact, of school children are taking action in this way, but also those people whose livelihoods are already being impacted are, are becoming more aware. But I think more talking, more public discussion, and more um, more public recognition about the urgency of this change. So educating yourselves, all of us need to do a lot more reading and a lot more talking, and I include myself in that. This has been very valuable. Um, the more we learn, the more we're able to, 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 to discuss this and speak about this in a way which is not arrogant and it's not about telling other people what to do it's about recognizing the impacts that we all face and that young people are facing in terms of their future their children and their grandchildren it's not my grandchildren who are going to suffer it's my children's grandchildren who are going to suffer 
this is, and in fact, it's it's maybe my children. This is getting closer and closer. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Hari Krishnan, and he is asking, who is sustainable development for? Does it take into account the indigenous population of a region? This question is in light of Barry Lopez's essay detailing the sector geography detailed by dream narratives of the indigenous population of Australia. I think, I think sustainable development is um, a concept which challenges us to understand the many different ways to think about land and the earth and our belonging to it, land and water, I might say. And it is extremely important um, that, that the views of Adivasi and Indigenous peoples in Australia are recognised as part of the, the human way of understanding environments. Um, I've spent time in Central Australia, a very arid, very hot, very challenging environment. And Indigenous peoples there are impacted by heat increases, by droughts, uh, by floods at times, and by a great many impacts of climate change, which is impacting and undermining the way that they are able to relate to their environment. It's damaging the more than human world. It's damaging the plants and the animals with which they are, they have an affinity uh, of, of which they feel to themselves to be a part. But as well as that, it's also damaging the health of human beings. So there are this, this affects everybody. Um, and the goals of any development has to be that we are looking more widely at all of those people who are affected culturally, as well as economically and environmentally. Uh, think about that in straight economic terms livelihood terms. We have to think about cultures and we have to think about social relationships and we have to think about the more than human world. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have one question. May I? Sure. Uh, ma'am, uh, do you think that this microscopic virus you know, has provided us one formative pause to refresh our actions regarding uh, more equitable and sustainable development. And this cause is important to all of us, all of us, you know, economists, comparatists, historians, linguists, biologists, to reconnect and converse with each other about issues regarding the sustainable development of, you know, uh, both the developed and developing countries. I think that um, we are in, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an irony. Those of you who, like me, are working in a university environment, a global university environment, as we're stuck in, um, are seeing increased focus on narrow disciplines. But in the real world, all problems are increasingly being addressed by teams. And you will be seeing that in your professional lives. We need teams of, of um, cultural experts. We need teams which include historians like myself indeed. We need teams which include linguists who understand issues around translation and meaning. We also need to understand the biology. We need to understand the ecology of the impacts of changing climates on the more than human world. And one of the sad things I think about historians, for example, taking my own discipline, is that there has been a great divide between people who see themselves as humanities scholars and people who see themselves as scientists and working in the hard sciences or, and, I mean, ecology is regarded as a rather wishy-washy end of that. But it seems to me that there's a great divide between those fields, but it is crucial that we are talking to each other because if we are, I mean, I think you can see this in the, the um, example that I've suggested that uh, Priya and Devlina are looking at in terms of the solar farms in uh, Western India. And they are, looking, they are looking at the social 
and economic networks around the environmental impact of uh, renewable energy. So the solar farms are, they may well be increasing the amount of renewable energy which can be turned into electricity generation, increasing the, the well-being, if you like, of, of surrounding people as well as the profits of the companies. But what the cost of that is, um, the, the farmer's use of their land for 22 years and maybe much longer than the lease if it's not brought back to them in a remedied condition. But it's also the immediate loss of livelihood of the landless labourers. So issues around justice, this is social justice and economic justice issues. It's political economy as well as political ecology. So we need to be thinking about that. And that means bringing people together who are, who are good at what they do. I don't think the one person should be good at a whole lot of disciplines. We're all trained and we appreciate the, um, the subtleties of our own discipline. We have to bring them together. So we have to be talking to each other. And it seems that that is, is what we need to do. We need to be communicating better. We need to be learning other languages. And those of you who are in translation are in a really good position to do this because translating, thinking in the language, uh, it, it seems to me it's just as challenging a job to think across the language of the humanities and the language of the sciences the language of biology and the language of physics. We need translators and interpreters to be thinking. We all think we're speaking English, but in fact, we are, we've are. we developed jargons and we've developed approaches to speaking, which our own discipline understands, but we don't understand each other. And I think it's crucial that, um, that we do, that we are talking to each other in order that we can um, talk across those disciplinary barriers and solve problems which require a multitude of different uh, approaches. Does Thank that you, answer your question, yes. Brenda? Yes, ma'am. And Hari Krishnan, have I answered the question you put before that? Please continue to, I, this is really, I am learning like everybody else. You know, like I said, there's no conclusion to my lecture because we don't know where we're going. We need to, we need to make up these we need to develop these solutions together. Uh, there is another question from Pansali Bhattacharya, uh, another colleague of mine. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much for the enlightening talk. I want to understand if in this context, anthropos can actually be beneficial for SDG. The term is widely used at present in the pretext of nat nature ecology and evolution. Is anthropause actually possible? All right. Um, I don't. I don't know that term. Um, so perhaps your colleague would like to explain it to us. Um, certainly to me, I'd be very interested in knowing what it means. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, I came to know about this term uh, recently. I was reading an article published uh, in this journal, Nature, Ecology and Evolution. So in the, con the, con the question that Rindan sir posed, uh, that uh, in the context of this virus, this, the way human activity has, uh, you know, forcefully, we might say that has come to a point of saturation, like it has been forced that we are, you know, being stuck in our room. So that is a kind of uh, scenario that has been created, which is anthropause. So anthropological activity being forcefully posed, put on a paused uh, note. So do you think that this is something that might help, uh, you know, uh, make the process of attaining sustainable goals faster or is actually uh, anthropause possible? Like, uh, is this term actually valid? Look, I think, um, I, I would respond to that by saying um, if, if the, 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 the age that we live in has been termed the Anthropocene because human beings are now shaping the way that uh, geological and environmental changes are occurring. And in that sense, 
the impact of human beings is 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 now greater on the planet than the impact of geological and other types of changes. I don't think that you and me um, can do a pausing in that sense. All of us, our loved ones, our neighbours, our communities, our countries are full of living beings who want to keep on living. Anthropause could only mean that there were no human beings left alive. There is no other meaning. I think people can't stop living. The question is, how can we live to in a situation that we find um, uh, a, a possible for life with enough food, enough warmth, enough environment, uh, environmental amenity, enough social and cultural um, amenity and meaning uh, for us to live sustainably in a way which doesn't damage future generations. I think that Brundtland report is a good one. I can't see any way that there could be an anthropause other than um, in the sorts of ways that I've been suggesting about changing the technologies that we use to generate power, for example, about changing things urgently to stop the release of uh, greenhouse gases. So we know what's causing the problem now over the last 20, 25 years. It has now been firmly identified that the problems are carbon dioxide, methane, it's the, it's the greenhouse gases which are increasing in the atmosphere. That has to be reduced. Now, it's a pretty drastic, it's not quite anthropause, but it's a pretty drastic argument that industrialization has to change dramatically. Power sources have to change dramatically. This is a very fast change that's needed. And so anthropause, if you take it to what um, the, the, the logical literal meaning is is, um, is essentially the death of human beings. We can't pause, we have to keep on living. But how can we do this in a way which urgently addresses what we know to be the problems? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I, I get your point and I totally agree to that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Panchali. It's a good question. Indan, do we have any other questions pending? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. We do not have any other. I think we can wrap up now. We can wrap up now? Yes. I, could I wrap up from me by saying what a great delight it is to be in touch with everybody. But um, although I can only see some of you because lots of you have just got your names visible, um, I'm available... We're locked down in Sydney, and I'm sure some of you are too. And you can reach me on email anytime if you've got further questions. Just let me know that you uh, met me in this forum, and I'll be more than happy to keep in touch. I, I look forward to further questions and further discussion about this. And you're going to have lots more talks on this topic by people who know um, other aspects of the question, and, and it is a question. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heather. Again, and thank you, Rindon, for starting I'm, this series. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Hidar Goodall for accepting our invitation. I hope that we'll have you in our beautiful campus soon. And thank you, Professor Shucharita Chattopadhyay, for chairing the session. I'm sure that you will be able to come to our university very soon. I thank all my colleagues, my students, and all the respected participants for showing interest in this talk on sustainable development. Goodbye and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. I'll be thinking of ah, you. Yes. yes. And I'm Thank more you. than happy to have contact. So please write to me and uh, any questions at all. I, we all need to be talking about this. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Rindon. Thank you, Sutarika. I'll Thank see you, you all soon.